Hi, I'm Mark Weibrow and this is the Electronic Cafe, the channel for the lovers of electronic music. And this is another very special interview edition. Hello, and I am Andy McNabb. So let's get started. So welcome to another brilliant interview episode of the Electronic Cafe. Before I get into the meat of the show, just want to make a couple of mentions. Um, I made an announcement just recently that we've had a couple of milestone moments. So the Facebook um, community is now past over a thousand members. Our YouTube channel, just over 3,000 subscribers. Cannot believe how we're just growing really fast now it's starting to get real momentum but i just want to say on behalf of mark and myself a massive thank you to every artist every person we've met for this channel um and the feedback we get is just so brilliant so i just want to say on behalf of mark and myself thank you if you've got friends that you feel should know more about us and checking and be sure checking our music out asking to subscribe that'd be great but just honestly, so wowed by the response and the reaction we're getting from people. Absolutely brilliant. So once again, a massive thank you from the Electronic Cafe. Right, a couple of other things. One of the great uh, friendships we've got is with these guys, Blitz Magazine. If you haven't subscribed to it yet, you really should. It's absolutely packed with some fantastic content. I mean, it's like if the Electronic Cafe was a magazine, make no mistake, it would be this. Just like I think if this magazine was a, a YouTube channel, it'd be us. We are such kindred spirits. You know, absolutely worth getting your hands on and subscribing to it. I'll ask Mark to put a link. There's some rather good journalism on one particular page. I don't know if you noticed that, but we're writing with the guys um, as well. So absolutely delighted to the guys at Blitz Magazine for allowing us to kind of tell more people about great music on the, in, within their amazing magazine. But I say, if you haven't subscribed to it, subscribe it is amazing um also you probably saw that mark and i said we're getting into live music as well so our first live event is going ahead so we are going to be introducing three incredible bands at the water rats on march the 25th next year tickets will go on sale on september the 1st mark and i will share all the information you need to get your hands on some there will only be 200 so they are going to go fast but you've got um national milk bar Cult with no name and beautiful machines all on the same night. This is the start of something very special for the Electronic Cafe, and I am beyond excited as I know market. So look out for more information on those tickets and get them while you can. Right, to the interview. So Mark and I have become really big fans of Mr. Peter Fitzpatrick, aka Circuit 3. And when this new baby came out just last week, we got him on the show to talk about it, and I have to say, what a lovely, lovely guy. Super smart, super funny, um, just a brilliant musician, and be prepared to be absolutely wowed by his collection of synthesizers that you'll see when we go, uh, when you see the interview. Absolutely stunning, but you know, absolutely, just one of the nicest guys you could wish to meet. It was an absolute pleasure to spend the morning chatting with him and his, this amazing piece of work. If you haven't got this album yet, you need to, because it's really, really, really good. So sit back and enjoy our interview with the brilliant Peter Fitzpatrick, a.k.a. Circuit 3. No, the, most stri- the most striking bit on the cover as well, Peter, is that yeah. mine seems to be signed by somebody and Andy's doesn't, so I think mine's... Well, yeah. you see, I, I, Andy Andy's, has Andy's to... quite upset about it. <laughs> well, I, I, would, I would actually send that album back to Analog Trash because whoever wrote on that now should be ashamed of themselves. <laughs> oh, well, right, I... OK, so I've got a full drew, so... <laughs>
Okay, everyone, welcome to another interview edition of Electronic Cafe. And today we have a guest that we've been loving and pushing since the release of The Price of Nothing and the rather brilliant value of everything um, a couple of years back. And now he's got a new, newly released album, Technology for Youth. Oh, look at it there. To the Electronic Cafe, the brilliant circuit free. Well, better Thank you. Patrick. Peter, welcome to the Electronic Cafe, my friend. It's so I'm, cool to hear Mark to finally meet you. I am delighted to be here because I've been... I've been following the channel for some time and I've okay. seen, I've seen who you've interviewed. So I, I, part of me is thinking somebody is going to tap me on the shoulder in a minute and say, sorry, but there's, there's somebody more interesting than you coming along here. Will you just get oh. off? So. <laughs> so no, not at all, mate. Listen, it's brilliant to have you. And this new album, you know, Technology for You, it sounds fantastic. You must be Thank really you. pleased with this. I, yeah. So the, there's a bit of a there's a little bit of a history around the album to answer your question yeah I, i'm i'm sort of i'm in the middle of what feels like a storm around this album where while i was doing the last album price of nothing value of everything yeah i i got fed up halfway through uh, for various reasons and i thought okay i'm not enjoying this go do something different and i started to write other songs that clearly did not fit into the last album um but all of a sudden, after a couple of months, I realized, oh, thematically, these are starting to work together. So I actually wrote a lot of it while I was recording the last album. And I just put it, I just parked it, put it on hold and said, right, let me finish this album and I'll do that. And then I, as soon as the last album went out, um, I completely neglected really doing PR for it, uh, which is to my probably to my detriment but i i went out i just went came back in here and said i have to finish this this these songs yeah. and the little uh, instrumentals and stuff and so it has taken all in all it's taken about four years to do and i think the the longest and most difficult part was just the this the the supply chain issues with the vinyl production yeah. because uh, i had plans for it i i knew exactly how i wanted to present it out to anybody who buys music and i've got a i've got a, f a following of fans and i wanted to i wanted to make something that would delight them visually as well as uh orally you know so yeah. it, it ended up with the with the five color variants um you know you can see you can actually see here in the band camp page um yeah. where you know you've got all those different variants there and they, i mean they look they, they look great like, nice. and you've got you know, you've got like the silver one, and then the one that everybody's gone for is that one. And there's only a, there's oh, only yeah. a couple of those left, the sunrise one, and the other one that everybody went for was the blue and white one. This one, oh, one. yeah, I got that one. <laughs> oh yes, that's yeah. the one you got. Yeah, so yeah. it was, um, you know, it it, it was just um, mm. the way I vision. I had the vision for it, which I think is important. And then, of course, the CD and everything, and mm. uh, so. I try and what was what's what I did this time, which I had never done before. I so-called road tested the songs. So I I during the pandemic, um, I started doing live stream shows, which is something I'd thought about doing, and finally and then realized, okay, well now's the time to do it. So I I rigged up a couple of little GoPro type cameras in the studio and a switcher and stuff, and just started doing these live streams, um, which were were fun it's kind of saved my sanity during the pandemic yeah. and i just i discovered I, I have a fan base out there because really and other artists will probably tell you this you just make the stuff you put it out there you might get to chat to people who've heard it but you're in this little bubble and you don't know does yeah, anybody well, actually listen to this yeah. Mm. yeah and and it turns out they bloody do which was great I, I I knew there was I knew I had something because yeah. I, I I didn't hate it, and um, I played it to a couple of trusted people, and they said yeah go for it. I did retweak a few of the mixes, and I realized okay I need to talk to a couple of labels about this and mm. analog trash. Within a couple of days, we said yeah let's let's work together, and uh, which was great because I I. I 
I I know their I know their artists and I know them as a label, and then I, I brought in Shameless Promotion to help out as well because, as you can probably tell, I'm keen just to get back to working the next album which I've already started writing, and what I love doing the PR, it's the organisation of it. I'm not great yeah. at it, and so yeah. I'm I'm so glad to have Shauna out there just doing that for me. And of course, Analog Trash themselves are mm. setting up things. So no, I I'm. I'm just thrilled with, with the I reception. Mean, yeah, you should be proud of it. I mean, you know, as soon as I put it on, and Mark said the same, as soon as you hear it, you just fall in love with it. Every track. Yeah, thank you. So much texture, beautiful sounds, some really great thought-provoking lyrics. I mean, you know, you, there's obviously a massive sort of, I don't know, it's more like a love letter to that space era, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah. You, yeah. You I, think, I, mean, you, I think we're all of, we're all of a certain age. I mean, uh, yeah. me and, yeah. me and Andy that. are older than you, but I mean, I'm yeah. I'm fascinated by yeah. the yeah. early space race and the Apollo and Gemini, and I've got books on NASA and all that stuff. So yeah, this kind of um, technology for the youth album, this is which is kind of aimed at that era. I was all yeah. over, I was all over that. Yeah, me too. Um, I mean, I I I like I I grew up. I, I was born in the mid '60s, and I grew up. I, I remember watching the moon landing. I was very, very young and I do remember watching it. And I was just obsessed with space and science fiction. And as a kid, if you ask me what I wanted to be when I grow up, it was always, oh, I'm going to be an astronaut. Yeah. And, then, and then reality kicked in and I thought, yeah, it's a bit dangerous. I won't do that. Um, so I, I, but I was, I was in love with science fiction. All, and also, I think around about the time I was writing it, there was a couple of things happening. A lot of the Apollo anniversaries were happening. It was yeah. 50 years since. So yeah. I was seeing some of the stuff on TV and I observed a couple of things when, when it was, we were getting, uh, I'm not very well educated in history, but what I did observe was, it's kind of like who invented the telephone and people automatically say Alexander Graham Bell. Well, Alexander Graham Bell was the person who first patented it which is not quite the same thing. Right. And right. it was, it, so with the space race, there is the official story, which is heavily influenced by, you know, US media. And then there are all the other stories. And that's what started grabbing my attention because I started looking at it and thinking, so I heard about, I read about Ed Dwight, for example, the first black African-American who was supposed to be in the space program, was supposed to go in one of the Apollo missions and didn't. And I thought, yeah. to my shame, I'd never heard of him. And, and that's what the song Spacewalking is about him. And in the live show, I use video of Ed, and it, it kind of explains what went nice. on. Putting it politely, he was shafted by NASA and the U.S. government, and it's shameful. And right. when I started reading those stories, I thought, what else is out there? Yeah, yeah. And then, then you get into the conspiracy theory stuff, <laughs> which was the best fun ever. I would, I would fall into YouTube and Wikipedia rabbit holes and I would have to write things down and just so I could go back to them. And I was, it was picking out sort of key words for me that I thought, oh yeah, that'll jump out in the lyric, that'll jump out in the lyric. And then it would just get into this story. So it's, uh, and so each of the songs has got something behind it. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah and, and I think that helps because um I, I think when you're singing it, then you're you're relating a story, which, yeah. which makes it a bit easier. Yeah. Did it did it start out as as one song, or did you always have it in mind that it would be kind of like a a concept album? You know, that was the form it would take. So, what happened? A, a thing that happened about let me see. I first met her about six years ago. So I'm sure you know Hannah Peel who yeah. is just, Love it's just a, an amazing artist. And I, I got to meet her and chat with her for a few minutes, uh, a few years ago. And we've had the odd message, you know, online. I, I'm not even an acquaintance, but uh, it was, uh, I, I, I the, the journey to Cassiopeia, you know, mm -hmm. album. And I, when I was listening to that, I thought, yeah, gosh, I'd love to be able to do something like that. And I said that out loud to somebody who said, 
uh, Peter, you are able to do it. You just haven't done it. So I thought, yeah. And as as the song started, as all these space race themes started coming into these songs, I thought, ah, so this is it. This is what's happening. So I, I then made sure that if I was going to spend the limited free time I have for writing music in doing that, I would orient myself toward those stories. And it almost became a race to try and capture as many stories that I was interested in till I had enough material for an album. So it was, it was intentional, but it didn't start out that way. Yeah. It, it was kind of just a very happy accident. And I'm in no way comparing myself to Hannah Peel, but she was really inspirational. And in a couple of the messages she sent to me, just I just thought, yeah, she's right. I should think about it differently. And, and I'm glad I did. I mean, you yeah. got you got the, the public service broadcasting race for space, I and mean, you got Daniel yeah. Sheets by OMD. Yeah. yeah, there's a there's a few albums out there which go along the same lines. I mean, you you was always going to be on the yeah, tough competition there, wasn't you? You wanted yeah. to make sure you did it and did it well. I, I'm flattered to be mentioned in that sort of space, but it's a pardon the pun, but it's a um, <laughs> it's a it's I think I think when you when you look at that and you you just see there is a there's a really great seam to mine with all of that because there's so much in it like even the the album title for example so you know uh omd just got slagged off by journalists for tesla girls oh they're making up words now and i remember that happening and i'm thinking really just don't display your ignorance for everybody to see yeah <laughs> and so you know that that was going on and then i thought yeah i need to capture little little phrases and things and i ended up looking at i thought i want to have a soviet inspired image and visual and aesthetic around this and i found this magazine called technology for the youth which has yeah. been around since the early 50s mid 50s and it's this wonderful i i describe it as washed out pastel color uh you know low cost print yeah. and if you if you just even go searching for technology for the youth you'll, you'll see the images and they are just so wonderful and there's a mixture of propaganda in there but also mm. pure science and a little bit of science fiction in it um and that's where the title came from and it was all it all just started coming together rather too easily and maybe it was because I, I just I had that focus and I I knew I was going to be searching for all of this stuff. So maybe that's why it worked. Yeah, but it does yeah, feel yeah. like it came together quite easily. Yeah, it's a great looking album cover. And you're right that, that you know, the, the 1960s Russian propaganda posters for the space race and yeah, and other things. Yeah is visually great. I mean, Franz Ferdinand used it, didn't they? Uh, yeah. As, as yeah, they did that. They they did the the very the the, the yeah it's the like forward their, Russia type their, stuff on their, yeah. de on their debut I mean, album and it's like it's a striking cover I mean I'm looking yeah. for that. Yeah, my my daughter Alison is a is an artist. Um, Alison did all of this, and there's little hidden things in there, like the the astronaut cosmonaut. We're not sure on the left. If you look, is actually dead. Yeah, the skull. Yes, yeah. yeah. So they go with the lost cosmonauts conspiracy theory, which we deal with in the song transmissions. Yeah. Um, and then you know, it's like the tape sticking on it. It's almost like the how the designers were just mm. at to some extent they were building the aircraft on the runway with some of this stuff. Yeah. And you know, bakelite components and mm. gaffer tape. Like how many gigs have we done where everything is held together with gaffer tape? And it could all just come crumbling down. I think there was a little yeah. bit of that. The most, cool. the most striking bit on the cover as well, Peter, is that it's mine seems to be signed by somebody and Andy's doesn't. So I think mine's well, yeah. you see, Andy, Andy has Andy's to. Andy's quite upset about. 
<laughs> but I, I would I would actually send that album back to Analog Trash because whoever wrote on that now should be ashamed of themselves. Oh, well, right, I, okay. So I've got a forgery. So. <laughs> so, 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 Andy, we will definitely we will definitely have to meet, and I will make sure to sign that album. Oh, mate, don't worry, we'll do it differently. <laughs> uh, mate, you signed my first one, so it's fine. Oh, mate. did I? Oh, great. Hey, <laughs> Mark went. Did you get your song? I went, no. He went. I have. I went. I. <laughs> it's great, mate. I listen. I, he I love. He hasn't stopped moaning about it for, for a week. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure there's people watching thinking, "Does that matter?" I collect vinyl. Exactly. It does. It does matter. That's why I, I'm flattered when somebody asks me to deface oh, their right, album. Look, when we meet, but honestly, I, I just love yeah. the album. Just going back, if mm-hmm. I can. So I read some of you in rock bands back in the day. So. I'm oh. not- about that journey to oh, a oh, photograph <laughs> a photograph appeared on social media three or four days ago oh really and it's on my timeline if you care to look for it i must i'll, I'll try and post it on the circuitry facebook page and maybe yeah. on twitter so it's from late 1988 and there's a row of people one of whom is um a former member of thin lizzy and then there's uh, this wow. um this very youthful looking individual with with long peroxide blonde hair who is not that far from a Roland synthesizer over on the stage and it's me so yeah i am um, so when i was in university uh i i was in a band of course and i was approached by somebody after a gig in dublin asking me look would you be interested in joining something that's a paying gig and i figured yeah okay so it turned out it was former thin lizzy drummer drummer brian downey um and i thought oh that's cool um and i i knew I, you know like any kid growing up in ireland in the 70s you, sure. you knew who thin lizzy were you know and but i wasn't a I wasn't I wasn't an obsessive fan, which probably helped because it meant I wasn't asking questions all the time, and and we had to just get down to it and learn the songs, um, and it worked out great because I, I, being in university, paying my way through university, I was working in a supermarket, packing shelves, a couple of nights a week and all day Saturday, and after the first gig I did, I realised I'd earned more for a two-hour gig. Um, than I did for a full day and a couple of nights in the supermarket. So I, yeah. I, I went I went into work the next day and handed in my notes and said, right, I've joined the band. Good luck. And Gary Moore, the late Gary Moore, came down to the gig one night. We did a residency in Dublin, and he came down to the gig one night just to try and persuade Brian to go on the road with him. And yeah. um, Gary walked up the stairs. We played upstairs, and I was setting up with the guitar player, and I had my back to the door. And you know, typically you'll get people coming in asking to see Brian. They wanted to sign a Thin Lizzy album, or whatever, and some voice comes in is is brian there and i said no he'll be here later we're setting up if you wait down in the bar and <laughs> I, the guitar player is looking at me and his draw his jaws just dropped <laughs> and he said you just told gary moore to f off downstairs man <laughs> and i said and for and then i almost responded yeah well so we should and i went oh crap what have i just done um and he was he was well he was quite popular at the time because he'd had he just had a hit single uh yeah. the loner and he played he actually played it with us that night and there was so this is pre-mobile phones you have to understand and there was one pay phone in the pub where we played we played up there was a big venue upstairs and the line of lads who would come in every week phoning around dublin saying you have to come in tonight you have to come in tonight the place was rammed people at the street and it was good fun i mean we played with him and Eric Bell, who was the original guitar player in the band, he played on Whiskey in the Jar and stuff. But yeah, nice. the only stuff I ever asked Brian about was the stuff that went on with, um, you know, around the era, era of the Blitz Club and all of that, because he was living in London at the time and he knew Rusty. Um, and, but also I wanted to ask him about Midge because Midge had been in Thin Lizzy. And yeah. he was telling me that, he told me two things. He said, 
first of all, he, he, he guided Midge. He kind of looked after him and said, no, you don't want to go to that party. And Midge had a, a little, small little road case with him on tour. And he was doing stuff in his hotel room. And I was fascinated by all of this. And, yeah. you know, in my in my mind, I was thinking, God, if Mitch came to Dublin someday, maybe he'll come and check out Brian. I might get to play with him. Of course, that never happened. But um, that was the one the one thing I would I, I wished I wish could have happened. Um, but I got to ask him about all of that, and he would he would he would explain to me about the concept of pushing the beat, and the sort of things that you you need somebody to teach you. So Brian was great. And I, I've seen, I, I saw him a couple of years ago. He's, he's doing wonderful, but yeah, that's what I did all the rock and blue stuff with a Juno yeah. one Oh six, which was great. <laughs> I got away with it. <laughs> and long haired out there, not at all electronic. I mean, he'd worked with Tony Visconti for crying out loud. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and like I grilled him about that and just like, it, it's, it's amazing when somebody has been in that orbit, and has worked with those people, they learn a lot of stuff. And whether you like that type of music or not, it's which is irrelevant. The, the the fact that they understand production techniques and songwriting, like he explained the boys are back in town to me. Yeah. The song that everybody knows. So anybody who doesn't know Thin Lizzy, Boys Are Back in Town, it's from Toy Story. It's yeah. used in all of these American stadiums. So Brian Co wrote that with Phil Linus. And he explained to me it's actually four different songs that they were working on. And I've seen, I, I've done a bit of that. The Beatles used to do that, like the side two of Abbey Road, with all yep. these sort of half inch songs. And it's actually, and the next time you listen to the boys are back in town, you suddenly realize, oh yeah. yeah, it's, there's, there's one song they were trying to finish. There's another. And they just joined them together, which yeah, is, yeah. was for the year that it came out and for the type of music they were yeah. doing, that was really clever and innovative. And it resulted in a, huge hit single for mm. them oh, so yeah. you, you learn stuff like that and that was the first time i'd ever heard of that being done yeah being man. naive i thought you wrote a song from beginning to end no yeah. you don't yeah, <laughs> you yeah, yeah i suppose that bohemian rhapsody i mean you could say that's yeah. that's not yeah. songs uh, three yeah. songs put together Exactly. I mean, yeah. I mean, Circuit Three. I mean, you've got a real sort of classic era synth sound, mm -hmm. and I ask you this through gritted teeth, looking at what's behind. <laughs> it, but, but do you use any software synths on in your process, or do you 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 try and stick with the the analog synths that, that you've oh, got? Oh, I I, I do use stuff? yeah, I do use software synths. I I have a it's it's not so much a sponsorship, but I have I have Roland Cloud. Um, so I have a VIP on yeah. that and basically I will use that because if you're on a laptop and you're away you need something to work with right, right, so right. no I will use software since and indeed I'll even use them um, I'll use them live because you have to travel light so if I'm playing and so if I have to travel somewhere I'm not hauling any of these with me it's just not going to happen so I'll use controllers and I'll use soft synths but um, by and large I think almost I'm trying. I'm trying to remember if I used any soft synth on the album, and I don't think I did. Writing it certainly, because sometimes it's easier. Yeah. But increasingly, I found myself over the last year when I'm writing stuff, I'm actually doing much more um, mono synth work, even though I've got a stack of poly synths. Um, so, just a, for anybody who's, who's not familiar, the mono synth is where it's one note at a time, mm -hmm. and it's led me down a certain path um, with the textures I'm doing and the, 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 the type of pieces I'm writing, but yeah, I I've, and I've nothing against soft synths. I think there's, there's two things going on with the love of hardware. Like you can get in and like hit say, and you can immediately just touch it and just change what's going on. Yeah. And you know, it just make it's, it's that tactile feeling. That was the Prophet 10, by the way. So it's that feeling of actually touching. Actually, let me show you the couple of them here, if you if you like. Let me see. I have a little handheld camera, which may or may not work for me. We'll this, try is where I, this is where I get really depressed. You get your credit card out. Uh, so you can't quite see it at the top there. 
that's the the Roland Juno 106. So that uh, the first synth I bought was a Juno 106, and the voice chips failed mid gig. Um, oh. Yeah, because there's a there was a thing then and got them replaced. I ha- I was I emigrated to New York and I lived and worked in New York for for years and I had to sell it just to I needed cash, um, oh. but I I managed to replace it. The Roland System Eight, which I'm a big fan of. If I was to bring a synth to play live, I bring this because it's quite light mm. and it's got very very brilliant um, recreations of their classic synth. So, you know, at a push of a button, you can switch to a Jupiter eight, which is great. Mm. Um, this is the poly synth rack. So that's the, that's the sequential OB six, which is the collaboration between the late Dave Smith and, and Tom Oberheim. And this was the pandemic synth, the profit 10, because I, I, I wasn't going out. So I found myself with a little bit of cash and went a bit mad. Um, <laughs> I've I have a friend who enables me, and I if I ever say to him, thinking of about buying something, I've put away the money for it. He says, "Yeah, go do it." So he, you know, he he's he's enabling my 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 habit here. Um, I think behind me, uh, I have a lot of mono synths over there. So from the top, there's a Pro One, which of course is the Vince Clark synth all over Yazoo's album. There's an SH101 there. There's the reissue of the Arp Odyssey the, with the full-size keys. There's the very lovely Moog. So on the third lay, lane down on the left is the Moog Sub-37. Sub yeah. yeah. And then the one to the right is a little Arturia synth, um, the Mini Brute, which is the one that I I bring to gigs if I'm ever going to meet somebody. And it's been signed by all of Owen. About that. <laughs> yeah, all of OMD have signed it. Vince has signed it. Gary Newman signed it. Martin signed it. Um, and the one person I forgot to bring it with me was uh, Tom Dalby, Thomas Dalby, and I oh, wow. kicking myself. But I'll find another opportunity. Don't track then, him down. A- anyone else yeah? want to add to that signature? Oh, there's a quite a few. Yeah, and there's a there's a Lindrum there on the bottom and a Behringer 808, and I've I've more over there. But we can get back to those. I think. I'm I, I I try not to overpay. So like the Juno 106, I managed to get that for a very reasonable price. Um, and then so a lot of the others you're just buying them new. It's 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 a very expensive hobby, but mm. it's all it's all I do. Yeah. I, I I you know I, I don't really do anything else and You can get some great copies now, though, can't you? As well, I mean, Bering Drew yeah. seems to be bringing out copies of everything. For... They they are some of them are very very good, and some of them are rubbish. Like the mm-hmm. the VC three forty over there, which is the vocoder string machine, is superb. It really is. But I've tried some of the others, and they're not great. I'm not a fan of the one hundred and one that they did. Right. Um, it didn't sound quite right. But what I do like about what they've done is they've enabled. This is something that wasn't available for me when I was younger. They've enabled a whole new group of people to get into hardware which i think is brilliant and it's admirable yeah. as yeah. and for that alone we should appreciate that they've done. Fam- famously as well um martin ware is very complimentary about your music but oh you, thank you. you lent him a jupiter 4 didn't you oh yeah um i had met martin at a heaven 17 show in the jazz cafe maybe four or five years ago and glenn as well two very personable people and we just got in chatting and that was it bumped into him again at another heaven 17 show said hello um i happened to have his email address and after i read the interview he had said it he had been asked in it are you going to use the original equipment and instruments and the answer was along the lines of would love to uh we'll try to but we like for example i don't have a jupiter 4 anymore and you know it's an integral part of those albums and i'd have to hire a buy one and i just thought don't do that here look i'll lend you mine i just gotten one the previous year um and i just emailed him i said look you're welcome to borrow it i'll bring it over and 
at first he was like, are you sure? And I said, Martin, I want these shows to go ahead as well. So <laughs> I want to see, I want to see the show happening. And he was very gracious. Um, and then the pandemic hit. He was meant to have it for like three or four months. <laughs> and then at the end of 2019, the plumbing pandemic hit and bless him, you know, he, uh, we, we, we kept in touch quite a lot. Martin was great. So we, oh, I brought the synth over really I had a lot of time for Martin and Glenn musically and politically mm. and we went out to lunch and stuff and he, he said uh, I said look I, I'll probably head off I'm, I'm going to fly back to Dublin in about three or four hours and he, he basically said look do you want to come down we're going to um, the Groucho Club I'm, I'm meeting uh, Alex James for Blur uh, do you want to do you want to come along? And I just found myself saying, "I oh, know it's okay, Martin. Just just go ahead there." And then I, as I'm walking away to get a to get the train back to Heathrow, I said, "What did you just do?" <laughs> but he was being he was being polite because you know I would have been a spare wheel there. But he was very he was very appreciative and he listened to my music and you know um, that's what I like about him. There's no us on them with Martin. And then during the pandemic, we were keeping in touch, and it was a running joke that like you know I have a Jupiter Four, but it's it's in a bubble in London. And eventually the shows happened, and it was kind of cool looking on the stage. Um, because, you know, I grew up on those albums and yeah. I was like, wow, they're using my bloody synthesizer to do this. <laughs> and he was playing it, but I've actually got the presets. I've saved his presets and I'm not That's overriding really. them. Yeah. And they're great. And it was all of you that. And he's used them in, a, used them in one of the songs. On the I album. have. The album. Yes. Yeah. In the after show, after the, the travelogue reproduction gig in the roundhouse, we were, we were in the after show and there was various people there. And I was just chatting with Glenn. And uh, for some reason, we started ch- talking about the synth. It had gone out of tune just before the gig or whatever. And I said, yeah, well, Martin's sounds are on it. You know what I'm going to do? I'm, I'm going to do a song called Jupiter City, you know, Toyota City, Jupiter City. And he started laughing. I said, Oh no, I am now. I'm going to do it. <laughs> the album hasn't been pressed. I could put another track on. <laughs> and uh, and I said it to Martin and he looked at me like, okay, whatever you think, man. <laughs> but I I that's basically what I did. I um <laughs> every sound on Jupiter City is one of Martin's presets, which uh which was just I just wondered, could I actually pull this off? Could I get away with it? Yeah, I got away with it. <laughs> it's a brilliant thing to do. Also, listening to your music, I mean, it is classic era synth pop. But we we know that you must be Kraftwerk, Thomas Dolby, Depeche Mode, yeah, yeah. You know, all, all of them, all of those, all of those classic, yeah. classic artists. And yeah. you know what you do does have that DNA going through it, so that's why we love it. But you also covered in its entirety the Upstairs at Eric's album, the Yazoo album, which yeah, which I yeah. think is one of the great. Oh, it's one of the best great album. albums of the eighties. Was it? It really, it, re- it old really old. is. Yeah, it really is. Um, so, anybody who knows me, I bored him to tears with it. I'm a huge Yazoo fan. They were my band when I was 15, 16, 17. I, I, ju- I actually did that for me. I wasn't going to release it. Um, I did it for me and I got some guest vocalists in because I thought, let's just make it a bit more interesting than just listening to me. And, you know, I, that was a, some people like the album, some people don't like it. And I can understand why, because when somebody touches a sacred scripture and you start, you know, putting it in comic sans font, you think, like, why did you do that? So I, I, I mean, I intentionally didn't try to be original with the arrangements because you know what? You can't improve on perfection. And I didn't have much time. I wanted to get it out. When I re- when I agreed, like, okay, I will put this out. I wanted to time it with the, it was the 30th or 35th anniversary or something of it. And I thought, no, I'll just, I'll just stick with the way they did it because it sounded great. And I had great fun doing it. 
um, it sold out. Like I did this lovely little metal tin and my daughter, Alison, did the artwork where it's the American footballer from the Only You single and um, the um, in the bath from the bathroom from the Nobody's Diary sleeve. Yeah. And I, ma- I managed to meet Alison Moye before Dublin show uh, and gave her a copy and she was laughing saying she was just talking about the Nobody's Diary cover to somebody and she loved it. I got a hug. So that was, you know, my wow. the 16 year olds, my 16 year old self thought that's it. I can, ret- <laughs> I can retire now. She was most gracious, a, a, a truly uh, wonderful, wonderful human being. Um, and, you know, delight. Like she signed a load of stuff I brought with me, including my live aid program. And uh, she, she said to me, you're too young to have been at live aid. And I said, Please tell my friends, tell my friends. And then I, ah. I got a copy to Vince. Um, I very funny. Um, I had there was a there was a running joke when he started the Very Records Twitter account, and yeah. I I said I replied I said oh welcome to Twitter where can I send my demo tape, and he replied to me saying I'll need a tape machine for said demo tape, and I thought okay, so I was in the U.S. on a business trip and I brought a little old tape machine with me and I, and. Through his through through his wife Tracy, I I I got she sent me their home address and I I mailed it to him, and he was he he, he emailed me some months later and said, uh, "Thank me for the for the the Azu album. That's very complimentary stuff about it. Uh, recommended a charity that because if I made any money off it, I wanted to go to a charity. Yes. And then he said, "Oh yeah, thanks for the tape tape recorder. It was useful ish." I just thought that's very Vincent. <laughs> so I was delighted because, you know, both of them have heard it. And it was it was kind of a dream that I had when I was a kid obsessed with that album. Um, I'm not doing the next one. People have asked me, I'm not doing the next one because I'll get nothing else done. But, you know, any anybody who's a hardcore fan yeah. of this will do it. Um, and cool. actually, I can say it now because time has passed. Uh, you, you know Deb Danahay. No. So Deb Deb was Vince's girlfriend back then, and yeah. Deb is very active on social media. She she started the so the first Depeche Mode gig was for her birthday party. So Deb then helped start the Depeche fan club back then, and she ran the Yazoo fan club for a long time. Right. And uh, lovely person, she, she's still you know somewhat in touch with Depeche, and we we know each other through social media we've met a few times she's come to some of my shows and i i persuaded her for i before e except after c i persuaded her send me something to put in it and she said oh don't put my name in it though because people will get weird about it and i just thought finally because everybody like eric's mum was on the yazoo album but deb who was at some of these sessions wasn't on it so she finally appears on a yazoo yeah. track which i think is brilliant so she's in there and i've never mentioned that actually so if somebody actually finds the, the Azu tribute thing I did. Go to I before you accept after C and try and spot Deb's voice. It's in there. I'm glad that we don't hear- Because my, my show mate. did the Broken Frame album in its entirety as well, didn't they? Yeah, they did. Yeah, yeah. I thought I, I enjoyed that. I like my show mm. a lot. I love um, show. What I love about what they did with it, they put their stamp on it. I, I didn't really do that. I, I, I just for all the reasons I've explained, but they mate, did. And, and on, on different artists, I mean, obviously Mark and I set this whole show up to obviously talk to great people like you and also promote new bands. Is, is there anyone you're listening to and loving currently you can share with our audience? Anyone that um, springs to the mind that you kind of love or you've loved over the last few years? 
gosh, uh, I've, I've, I became obsessed with Roisin Murphy during the pandemic. Yeah. Um, I started listening to this artist. So what, when I'm at work in the home office, I can't really listen, listen to stuff with lyrics. It's too distracting. Um, right. There's a lot of rubbish ambient music out there, really poor. But I found one yeah. person um, who actually was doing live stream shows through the pandemic. Um, his name is Martin Sturzer. I'll try and put it in the chat. There's two things I love about Martin's music. It's all analog instruments, um, and he's got no notions about himself, to use an Irish expression. And he's very modest, and I, I really love him. But also, he's got a cat called Neptune, who frequently interrupts and just will, as he say, like he says, he's playing something, the next thing you know is cat in the middle of the performance going out to many hundreds of people on, on YouTube will just sort of walk over, sit on the keyboard or start nudging his hand or whatever, and you can't get rid of him. Um, and you play the game, you're trying to spot Neptune, where is he sleeping in the studio? But his music is lovely. It's um, it's not that wishy-washy ambient stuff. He's got actual melody behind it, and he does some Berlin right. school stuff. So Martin Sturzer is definitely one. Um, yeah. I think there is also an album that I started listening to again by a Dublin artist called Polydroid, um, yeah. whose real name is Brian O'Malley. He's a film director and he's a really good friend. And I'm glad I have the CD because it's all out of print. I must try and persuade him to re-release it, but it's probably mm -hmm. out there. Polydroid. Uh, I think the album is called The Human Is Only A Cell or something. I love that. Right. That's all instrumental stuff. Yeah. And I think Nation of Language. Yeah. Yeah, I think Nation of Language. <clears throat> yeah, we saw them in Dublin um, and it was, yeah, and they're coming back. They're back in the, in the winter. So, yeah, mm. hope, hope, hoping to see them again. I would be to see them again. But they're great recommendations, buddy, because yeah, I'm sure our guys, our, our viewers will go and check those out. So thank you for that. What's next for Circuit 3? Um, well, the album is only out a matter of days. Um, I'm starting to get the stats coming in from different streaming services and Wow, <laughs> it's got it's getting a lot of attention. So I'm gonna just ride this way for a little while longer. I'm uh, I'm doing lots of PR, um, and we're doing. Let me see, the physical product is going out, so I'm spending a lot of time going to the post office to send signed sleeves over. To that, the, did you say signed ones? Sorry, yeah, signed sleeves because when people <laughs> buy it and they want it signed. You know, they remember oh, yeah, in the band camp coming to ask for it. You know, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I got mine signed, yeah. So you did. And I mean, what sort of person doesn't ask for it to be signed? Oh, some idiots. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you're, you're breaking up. You're, you're on mute. You're on mute. Um, so I do a bit of, do a bit of that. <laughs> Next up is August 21st. Of course, if people are watching this in 2023, you've missed it. Um, August 21st. 2022 i'm doing a live stream of the entire album oh, um, from the studio um I've, I've said it out loud and now i actually have to practice and i've got <laughs> and now now the, now the fear has just kicked in when i've realized i've just said that out loud i'm <laughs> going to do it so we're working with uh with, with the analog trash team to do it unlike my other live streams we're not doing it on facebook and youtube etc for various reasons, not least is just how badly they, they're treating artists when you try to do this stuff. We're going to do it through Bandcamp. That's that's in itself is fine. They do it and it looks great and it that will work. It just means people have to go to Bandcamp to see the stream. And um, So we're going to do the full yeah. album from beginning to end and then I might just do a couple of old songs at, at the end. Mm. So that's on August 21st. It'll be at 6 p.m. UK time which is kind of lunchtime on the East Coast of America. It's just after breakfast time on the West Coast of America. But then after that, um, we are going to do live gigs in the UK. It's just too soon because summer stuff has still gone on. We are going to do some live stuff. It will be around sort of the West Yorkshire, Leeds type area. If I can get invited to a show in London, I would go there at a the drop of a hat. Um, I'm already working on the next two releases. Um, I've got something special in the pipeline as well. Um, so there's there's a, there's actually three things on the go. And then last night, um, a local artist got in touch with me and asked me if I'd help finish a song with them. So yeah, I'm going to be busy getting back into 
just doing this. I've missed, mm. I have missed doing all of this. say peter you did an amazing thing last week when you know a lot of ah, people, a lot of people are struggling financially at the moment and you put that message out saying if oh anyone, yeah yeah if anyone wants a, a download of the album just get in touch i mean you know i'm gonna tip my hand give you full kudos for that i mean it's a, oh, great, thank you. It's a great thing to do yeah thank you i i, I didn't yeah it's just it's what you do right look uh, i've been that broke student where you just didn't have the money for it and I want people to hear this. It's the, like it's like with your channel. You're not doing this because you you want to make money out of it. No. Like there's there's ways to make money that don't involve nearly as much effort that you put into the channel, right? Like if you yeah. if it was about money, you do it. And similarly with me, look if I can if I can recoup, I could the label like I'm, I'm, I'm probably watching this now saying Peter, shut the hell up, stop giving stuff away. <laughs> um, <laughs> but if I can break, no, they they they're great. They're socialists like me, but they. I, I want people to be able to hear it. And I think money is should not be an acceptable reason for somebody to not be able to hear something you've made. And also, I don't want people having to make a decision between, this sounds pompous, but it's happening. People are making a decision about food or utilities and what yeah. they love doing. And I, it would just kill me if I thought somebody was not doing something essential because they wanted to blow some money on their passion and look yeah. i joke about the vinyl selling it is selling it's not going anywhere fast there'll still be some copies left and there will be cds so i'm happy for people just to get the download codes um because it is just about getting the music out there um and i've done it before with with, with other releases um yeah. and and actually anybody watching this look if 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 you're if you're prioritizing your bills you can't be going out buying vinyl cds or even digital like just send me a message i'm on I'm on Twitter. I'm on Facebook under Circuit Three Music, Twitter Circuit Three Music. It, just send me a note. I'll happily send a couple of download codes. I want people to hear this. Mate, Mate, it's, I, um, you know, it's uh, you're spot on. It's a great gesture, and uh, yeah. uh, it is a great gesture. It's uh, well received, I think. Yeah, and yeah, we'll, but, we'll, we'll we'll do another promo for the album so people want to buy it. Vinyl. If they, if we just say if they send you a note to sign it, and I'm not taking the piss or making a joke. <laughs> <laughs> is that all right with you because we, oh, of course yeah no i do sign stuff and, that, and that's no problem what what yeah. i do is i've held a few sleeves back in dublin most of the physical stock is with analog trash but i i have some and i just i just sign them and, and i'll send i send them okay. over so it's no it's it's no it's, it's no problem at all it, it delays the shipment a few days because it's really i have nice to sign stuff well, Andy, so really, it's, it's yeah did I'm I use not, the gold pen for that? Not, I think. <laughs> was that the was that was that was that the gold sharpie I used yeah. on that one? I've got the black sharpie. Yeah, it was on. beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the gold sharpie is for the the VIP sales. <laughs> one final question. Yeah. What? Oh, two actually. Where did the name Circuit Three come from? Ah, so back in 2014, so I gave up doing electronic music. I thought nobody wanted to listen to the type of electronic music I knew how to make because I used to do it professionally. I was, when I lived in New York, I was a sound designer and music composer and I did everything electronically and I'd given up. I had zero confidence in myself. Um, I had started dipping my toes back in the water of actually performing as a solo artist. So I got a guitar, went out. I did a workshop with Tom Robinson, you know, Tom yeah, yeah. Robinson band, uh, which I'd heard of through his BBC show. And he gave me great advice, great coaching, great encouragement. And I went out, I started writing songs again, just on the guitar, kept it simple and just uh, improved my confidence a little bit. And then I treated myself to some soft synths and started writing songs. And in the first day, what songs came? New Man, Blue Diary. And those who were dancing came on the first album came in one day, just goofing wow. around with the synths. And I thought, oh, I'm enjoying this. And I said, look, just for once in your life, Peter, just do it because you're enjoying it. Save yeah. it. 
thought nothing more of it. And I sent one of the songs then to somebody who didn't realize it was coming from me. And he said, oh, we're doing a little festival in Dublin. Do you want to play? And that's where it all started. And I got back into it, just built a bit of confidence. And um, I was, I figured, well, I have to I have to have a name. So I chatted with a friend of mine and he said, well, circuitry. I said, what? Circuitry? And basically <laughs> it was, it was a pun on the Irish accent yeah. and how we say circuitry. Yeah. And I said to him, oh, that's brilliant. So yeah, I'll use that. And I did a search online. Nobody else is using it. Great. Register the domain, you know, grab the YouTube channel, all of those things. And then I, a few months later, I, a couple of interviews in, I realized this is a stupid idea, Peter, um, because you have to explain it to everybody. So that's where it came from. It was a joke with a friend <laughs> about how we, how Irish people will say the word circuitry. I think it's a, so good, I think it's a good name with a, with a three on the end as well. It's, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> I should I sh- I should have just gone to um I should have taken the Heaven Seventeen route and uh, the Maloka route and just gone through the film um the Clockwork Orange and just figured out is there anything that nobody else has taken yet <laughs> can I use one of them <laughs> and I did entertain I did entertain the thought for a, for a week or two and then I thought no that's just no somebody somebody will have stolen it okay and my the final question would be yeah. what has been the highlight for Circuit Three so far. I'll give you three, I think, seeing as a circuit, I'll give you three. Uh, I think one of them was just getting this album out because it's. It, I had this. I had the vision for what I wanted to do. Yeah. So that's been hugely satisfying. I think the second one is um, realisation during the pandemic that I actually had a, f- a fan base. It's not huge, but I was getting a few hundred people coming at a time to the YouTube shows. That was hugely helpful because... I've struggled to get live gigs in Ireland. It's that's a whole other story. Um, and it's really difficult. Um, there's an ageism problem here. Um, and I uh, that was just so satisfying. And I was able to connect with people. And then I think the third one was um as a result of doing my little Yazoo thing, I got to chat yeah. with and meet Vincent and Allison, which was yeah. such a huge deal. A yeah. huge deal for me. Uh, every part of it has just been so rewarding. Amazing. And you met some incredible musicians on the journey, mate. But I mean, amazing. Yeah, I, I just, yeah, it's it's mind blowing. And then when you meet them, you find out, you know, how kind they are. I mean, yeah. Thomas Dalby, we had a great chat because we've we've his 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 adult his adult son is transgender and as is mine, and we had a great chat. We were talking as parents, which. You know, if you said to me at 16, oh, you'll meet Thomas Dolby and you'll be chatting about your kids. Mm-hmm. I just thought, wow, that's uh, that's not going to happen. It happened. <laughs> Martin and Glenn were just so pleasant, so nice. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, any of those people that I've met have just been great. <laughs> Even Gary Newman, we had a great little laugh. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> you know, when me and Andy started this, I mean, we'd never thought that when we was watching Craftwork, in yeah. we would ever get to speak to Wolfgang Fleur. I mean, yesterday we had a little chat with Cole Bartos. I hey, saw the pictures. How um, how cool was hey, that? You know, he, he was lovely. Yeah, you know, we spoke to Martin Ware. We, you know, we, you know, we got Neil, Ar- Neil Arthur's a gent. <laughs> Neil Arthur. Oh, <laughs> you mentioned Neil Arthur. There's an artist who has evolved in the 21st century, oh, and he yeah. he doesn't get the credit for it, which kills me. Yeah. And you know, if there was somebody who in the realms of possibility I could work with, Neil would be very interesting. Yeah. I mean, obviously, I, I, you know, if you're talking to people you want to work with, Vince Clark, obviously, but yeah. that's not going to happen. Martin, that's not going to happen. But Neil, maybe because I've observed he does like to work with new people yeah. and the stuff he's putting out is so good. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, I, I I got to meet him. Did you know the, do you know the Blamange documentary? Uh, you keep me running round and round. I'm no, I haven't seen the documentary. Ah, oh, there's a documentary. Um, this is how I met Neil. Um, so, long story short, they came to Dublin. The date was moved. I was traveling for business, missed the show. But it turns out they were making a documentary about it, which is available online. I'll send you the link to it. Brilliant. And the documentary is a mix. It's the Blamange thing the live show interviews with Neil, all the rest of it. And then interviews with various members of the electronic music community 
in Dublin, or as we, we, we used to, so everybody had their tribe and we were the synth heads. And I was interviewed in that and uh, met Neil that day during they were filming the interviews. And then I went to a Blumont show somewhere in Hoxton um, and I heard a voice behind me. Hello, Peter. It was him. He, he'd remembered my name. That's the caliber of the man you're dealing with. Peter, thank you for your time this morning. Um, Pleasure. Absolutely. We genuinely love the album. It's a oh, great thank you. It's a great piece of work. I mean, um, thank you. Uh, love the sound of it. Love the concept of it. Um, we love your stuff in general, but we thank really you. appreciate your time. Yeah. No, no. This is this has been a ton of fun. A ton of fun. More people should come on this channel. Definitely. Absolutely joy to meet you. And uh, let us know about those dates. And uh, oh, I will. We'll happily come up to north to see you, mate. <laughs> where, where it's grim. I believe it's grim. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to say it too much. I've got a lot of friends up that part of the world, so I'm going to say My My daughter's living up that way now. She'll kill me for saying that. Um, I'm, we'll, I'm going to play it with my synths now because it's, it's on, Saturday. I'm going to play it with my synths. You might, you might get a knock on the door a bit later from Mr. Wybrow on here. There'll be a screech of tires. There'll be a screech of tires and I'll be around. <laughs> well, you're always welcome to visit Dublin. Um, oh, chaps, lovely. thank you so much. I love you. Take care of yourself. We'll buy you oh, a beer. We will. We'll buy you yeah, a beer. We'll buy you a beer, definitely. Thanks, Looking mate. forward to it. Take care. Yeah, Enjoy mate. the rest of the day. Bye. Bye. So that's it for another brilliant interview edition of the Electronic Cafe. I hope you enjoyed Mark and my conversation with the very talented Peter Fitzpatrick. Circuit 3, Peter, thank you again, mate, for coming on. Absolutely enjoyed every second um, of our conversation. Hope to see you soon. And, you know, hope you're coming over here to play some live gigs because we will definitely be there to see you. Right. We'll see you very soon. Uh, next episode uh, of the Electronic Cafe. In the meantime, again, thank you for all your amazing support. Stay safe. We'll see you soon. Bye bye for now. Thanks, Peter. It was a real pleasure talking to you, and hopefully, this episode shines a light on the brilliant music of Circuit 3. Thanks again for watching. See you all next time. Take care. Bye bye.